After the show, we'll be out there, and people ask, you know, how, how we met, Tam and I met. She was a waitress at a comedy club uh, back in, in the 80s, and uh, she had this beautiful laugh. I was on stage. I don't know if you've ever been. You normally can't see the audience. I just heard this beautiful laugh in the back of the room from this woman. She was a smoker at that time, so smokers have the best laugh. I mean, when, when you cannot get oxygen into your lungs, <laughs> that's music to a comic's ears. So I'm on stage talking, and she's in the back. <laughs> you know, so... All I know is I was excited, so. <laughs> and uh, we struck up a friendship that week. She had a two-year-old boy. She was a single mom. She was working two jobs, which I had deep respect for, because I could barely do one job. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, I was living in L.A. She was living in Ohio, and uh, that was November. I asked her to marry me in April, and uh, she got pregnant in May. We got married in July. And uh, I went from single and traveling 50 weeks a year doing comedy clubs and casinos to married and two children uh, in one year. And um, probably 11 months after that, uh, I, got into, I got into Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, my father asked me, my father wrestled with alcohol his entire life. He said, what was the catalyst? My father understood that people just don't quit drinking, you know. Something bad has to happen. Uh, so I told him the truth. I said, I beat my six-month-old son in a crib. And um, nothing in my life. When my wife sat on the end of the bed to feed our six-month-old, and I realized what I had done, uh, the shame and the humiliation that washed over me, not the drunk tanks, not the bar fights, and certainly not the screaming jags with my wife, humiliated me more than that single act. And uh, I said to my wife, if you don't take me to Alcoholics Anonymous, I won't go. And if I don't go, I don't know if we're going to make it. Not even thinking about her. She already had one guy bail on her and left her a kid, and here's another kid, and I'm bailing after 11 months. So she takes me to an AA meeting, and they tell me to pray. I said, to what? I didn't believe in God. And they said, well, find something in the universe bigger than yourself. That single question, does God exist, and if he does, who is he, overrode my life for about eight years, and I started I started in the 12-step program with the third step prayer, they call it. God, remove me from the bondage of self so that I may better do thy will, taking away my difficulties so that victory over them others may bear witness to thy strength, thy power, and thy way of life. I said that prayer every day along with the serenity prayer. Grant me that God, grant me the serenity. I didn't believe in God, but they told me this is the way you stay sober. And I was going to stay sober. I was going to do whatever they told me to do. That's all I knew. I was going to do whatever they told me to do. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Those two prayers ran my life for eight years. And from those prayers, I believe God said, here we have one. I wasn't ready. I don't know how to explain it. I had a lot of learning to do. If God had sat me down on day one of Alcoholics Anonymous and said, this is what I'm going to put you and your wife through for the next eight years. But at the end of these eight years, you're going to know my son, Jesus Christ, and you're going to know a peace that you never knew could exist on this planet. I would have never signed on. Eight years into my search, people were still telling me, you need a higher power, you need a higher power. And I go, what is that? And they go, well, it's whatever you want it to be. It's just, you know, I said, look, if I'm making up a deity, that makes me delusional. I get it. God exists or he doesn't. But what, what, what is this? I mean, it's great until you got life. You know, death of a child, a loss of a job cancer and you're on your knees praying for some calm in the middle of a storm that's all i want you want some peace in the storm grant me the serenity accept i can't change the circumstances but i can certainly accept it please help me and your brain is chirping what, what are you praying to who are you praying to you made it up and in the same token if i walked in alcoholics anonymous 32 years ago and somebody would have put me an arm around me and said you need jesus christ i'd have left God put me right where I needed to be, with the people I needed to be, and I needed, I needed time. I'm a skeptic at heart. I'm not an easy sail, let's put it that way. And one night, Tammy and I got into an argument in our kitchen, and I stood on a stool. I was about eight months sober. I, got, I stood on a stool, and I yelled at her. I screamed at my wife till she fell to her knees and wept. And I was putting my son to bed that night, and he goes, Daddy, you win. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you yell, Mommy cries, you win. Not one of my prouder moments as a man. And if there's a man in this room that thinks I walk downstairs with my chest puffed out and my head held high, I sheepishly walked up to my wife, and I said, I know, you don't want to hear this, but I'm sorry. I'm trying, baby. 
I'm going to go get some help. I started therapy. First thing the therapist asked me, she said, do you read? I go, no, I've never read a book. Well, I'm going to give you a book. It was Road Less Traveled. In the beginning of that book, it says life is difficult. When it can be accepted as such, it no longer is. It just becomes a series of problems that need to be solved. It's a self-help book. And another thing I got out of that book was this. True love can't even begin in a relationship until conflict enters the relationship. You cannot have a loving relationship without conflict. And he said everything that leads up to that first moment of conflict is an illusion put there by God to keep the species going. We've all been there. If you're over the age of 30, you've had that euphoric feeling with the new person. And then eventually you say, hey, I'd like some Chinese food for dinner. Well, I want Mexican food. Now there's conflict. <laughs> now there's a chance for this relationship to actually grow. And that resonated with me because prior to meeting my wife, every relationship I ever had when conflict entered, I fled. Conflict resolution in my home growing up was pretty simple. If you stood up to, your, to, stood up to my father, he'd pitch me against the wall. That would be the end of the conflict. So I learned to hate conflict. And I married. God gave me a woman who apparently loves conflict. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. You get into these arguments, I'd feel this wave come over me, and I, was just, I, I just wanted time alone to calm down. So I'd go, just give me three minutes. And I'd go into another room, and she'd be on my hip. Where are you going? Where are you going? I'd go, just, just leave me alone. Please, just leave me alone. Why do you need to be left alone? I don't know. Just leave me alone. We didn't know how. And I only knew one thing, yell. That was it. Punch, some, punch a wall. Throw, break a dish. Smash something. That was the end of it. I didn't want to hear it. I was telling Pastor, uh, we, we, we moved a lot, and we got to Arizona, and I put a 50-pound bag out on my, on my porch that I could hit when I got this way, when this bile, any man knows what this is, that discernible click in the back of your head, and you're gone. Whether it's the shame that kicks it, the humiliation that kicks it, something kicks it. And I'm out on the porch one night, and I'm hitting this bag, and I'm hitting this bag. And years later, Tammy says to me one day, she says, you remember that bag you used to hit? I go, yeah. She goes, every time you went out and hit it, I thought you were hitting me. Really? I just hidden, babe. Just hidden. I don't know where this anger comes. I did not know. I did not know. But I was looking. I was looking. I was looking so hard. And I can tell you this. There was times that Tammy would look at me and she, she would try to shake me. And, and if you're in a marriage that is full of acrimony, wait to get to apathy. God never intended human relationships to be apathetic. That's when Jesus said, be, be like a little child. I look at my grandchildren, and you know, my son said to me one day, what's so special about grandbabies? I said, babe, son, when you were that age, I was so wrapped up in myself. They say there's no smaller package than a man wrapped up in himself. And I was wrapped up in myself, and all I wanted to do was put a roof over your head, put clothes on your back, and I was just out there struggling, son. I was just trying to make a living, just trying, and I, I missed, I missed all those years. But I'm soaking it in with these grandbabies. That joy, when they walk in that room, Papa, I mean, my God. And when they get crabby, I just text my kids, come get them. You know, it's just, I get all the joy. I get all the joy. And that's the way we're meant to be. Can you imagine Adam and Eve when they came out? The first day they, that God breathed life into them, getting in the garden and went, oh, like, oh, you know, or huh. another day, another dollar. I think it would be like, oh. Tammy said to me one day, she goes, I get the impression you don't care. I said, I don't. She said, what do you mean you don't care? I said, I don't. You don't think I don't want to care? You think I wake up in the morning and I look at all this responsibility? The, 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 the more, I was a, we were a single family, single income family. It was all on me to make the money, and I just didn't care. I just didn't care. We were losing everything. House was gone. They repossessed the car. And I remember my wife calling me on the road. You knew this was coming. You knew, you didn't tell anybody. Your sons are on the driveway crying because someone's taking their daddy's car. You coward. She was right. I just wanted an answer. I don't know if you know what it's like to wake up every day of your life just confused. This thing descends on you. You look around, the world says, you got a beautiful wife, you got healthy children, you got a roof over your head, you got a job you love. All of the, check the boxes, baby. Check them all. And people look at you and go, why are you so miserable? I don't know. That's the answer. I don't know why I'm so miserable. 
It would be so much easier if I was in jail and every day I woke up and somebody beat me with a stick because at least I could say, that's why I'm miserable. I don't know how many times I got outside and just yelled at the heavens, why? Why? I just wanted to have a, I just want to be normal like everybody else. I got wrapped up in this gerbil in my kid's room. My Tammy says to me one day, what's with you in the gerbil? Yeah, it's funny now. You know. I said, look, it gets sticks on one side of the crate, and brings them over to the other side, stacks them up. And then when they're stacked up, he gets them over there and he brings them back over here and stacks them up. And every now and then he spins a wheel in the center for entertainment. And she goes, so? I go, that, that's our life. I go, she goes, what are you talking about? I go, I'm projecting. Five, ten, I, that's it. I work, I make a few bucks, we buy a few things, it wears out, we take it to the landfill. You know, if I'm lucky, I get a sitcom deal or a movie deal, I make a lot of money. We get, it's still stuff. We bring it home, the sticks we bring home, they wear out, we take them to the landfill. And I'm looking five, ten, fifteen, if that's it, if that's my life, getting sticks and we're letting them wear out and taking them to the landfill, I'm checking out. And Tammy says, you checked out years ago, pal. You've been gone for years. We're losing the house. God put a man in my life. We are his instruments. Discipleship is out there. I wasn't coming into a church. I met God and his disciple on a golf course. And we were working together. He was a millionaire. He was doing comedy for a hobby for 100 bucks a week. And I was reading Ayn Rand at this point. I went through New Age. I went through Buddhism. I went through, you know. Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. I was examining my life. And still doing those prayers. Remove me from the bondage of self. So we're on a golf course one day, and we're, I'm talking about Ayn Rand, and I'm talking about this and that, and I said, if it's materialism, maybe I can make enough money. I can keep the house, and maybe Tammy will be happier. So how do you accumulate wealth? He said something like, you cannot begin to enjoy the creation to have a relationship with the one who created it. Yeah. He said, materialism never will bring you joy. I said, that sounds cool. Where'd you read that? He goes, it's in the Bible. I go, the Bible. Oh, okay. A couple holes went by. I said something else. I go, that's great. Where'd, where'd you read that? He goes, the Bible. I said, stop it with the Bible. He goes, what do you mean? I go, who, who reads the Bible? I mean, really? You know, a little archaic. God, God's word. Come on. We're in the 20th century here. He said, well, well, let's back up. What's in the Bible you don't think is true? I go, I don't know. I'm an atheist. I don't, I don't believe in God. Let alone, you know, I, I've never read the Bible. He goes, then you're not an atheist. You're a moron. You know, and... Uh, hmm. Anybody here knows that clicked, you know, I wanted to hit him, but I had enough restraint. I said, well, how so? He said, I'll give you the short answer, that this kind of infinite God in an infinite universe, which you're denying exists as an omniscient being, in order to truly deny that, you yourself have to be omniscient. It's a self-defeating argument. You cannot defend an absolute negative. I looked at that man and said, what? He said, I say this out of love. You're not smart enough to be an atheist. I said, you don't know either. He goes, I think I do. And he said, I'd like to help you out. This is discipleship. I'd like to help you out. I said, how so? He goes, I go to a church in Denton, Texas. They have a tape ministry. He teaches the Bible. I think you'd enjoy his teaching. He doesn't condescend, and he doesn't hide and run from the hard verses. I think you'd enjoy that. I said, will it cost me any money? He goes, nope. And I said, well, you send me what you want. He said, can I send you a Bible? I said, you can send me whatever you want as long as I don't have to pay for it. The Bible came three days after we parted company. I threw it in a junk drawer. The tape started coming. In a year and a half, a year and a half, God put my wife and I through hell to the point where we were 10 minutes from filing divorce papers. We had them filled out. We had them notarized. And 10 minutes from the courthouse, Tammy says, this is wrong. Let's go home. If you don't think God will bring you to the edge of your life, I drive 10 more minutes. I drop those papers off. I lose 20. Three years with a woman, I never knew I could love the way I love this woman. I never knew, I would not know my grandchildren. I would not know. I, I, I don't even want to go down the long litany of things I would lose. And it wasn't easy. 
But we went home. After six months, she takes the kids. She goes, I'm going to Ohio. I'm getting away from you for a few months. I'm taking them to my parents. You need to figure out what you're going to do with your adult life. If you don't want to do comedy, don't do comedy. But, Jeff, you've got to do something. We're losing the house. And as she leaves, she gathers up these tapes, and she throws them at my feet. And I've got to hurry up here. But I, uh, the first one I opened up was Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. I couldn't even pronounce Ecclesiastes. I gotta get, so anyway, then I remember I got a Bible. It's in the junk drawer. If you've got a junk drawer, nothing ever leaves a junk drawer. Uh, until you get a shed. That's a suburban version of a junk drawer. So anyway, I pulled the Bible out, opened up Ecclesiastes from the beginning of that tape. Meaningless, meaningless. All in life is meaningless. My heart leapt. Oh, I went, whoa, that's in the, that's true. That summed up eight years. I came to those same conclusions. Nothing of this earth will ever give you lasting joy. And basically what I got out of that first sermon was this. Life without God will have no meaning. Without meaning to your life, there's no purpose to your life. Without purpose to your life, you might as well off yourself. And I heard that sermon, and I went, oh, that's in the Bible. So I ripped open every envelope looking for more Ecclesiastes tapes. There's got to be another one in there. And the other one was, if happiness was an act of human will, we'd all be happy. Because you ask anybody what they want out of life, they're going to tell you, I want to be happy. What do you want for your kids? I want them to be happy. Well, how do you define that? If it's the next iPhone, the next gym shoe, the next house, the next car, the next relationship. We live in a wealthy, wealthy nation. You could stuff that into your body forever if you got enough money and resources. Blaise Pascal described it as a God-shaped hole that's inside every human being. And we keep trying to stuff the world into this hole, and it never lasts, and it's never satisfying. But the truth is something outside of us has to come inside of us, and it works its way out into the form of service. Service. You want to be loved, you got to be loving. So then you ask yourself, well, how is that? What does loving look like? Well, Ephesians gave us an entire book on how I'm to love my wife. And we have built our marriage on the foundation of that for 22 years. We have tried. We've tried. It's far from perfect, believe me. But that is our go-to. We go to the Bible. I'm telling you, I, I did a year and a half's worth of Bible study in about two months. I was in the car, staring with one leg, making notes in my Bible. I almost met Jesus before I met Jesus. And the people, were, people, were, people were waving one finger at a time at me. Just, hey, you know, just, you know hey, you know. I gave my life to Christ 20-some years ago. But what that means is, to give you, put it in perspective, that would be like me driving a Yugo, 74 Yugo, into a Lamborghini dealership and then telling the salesman, all right, I'm ready to trade you even up. <laughs> if you want to know what service looks like, go to the cross. Just look at what was done on the cross. Look at Jesus' life. That is service. That is love, to sacrifice for another. And uh, anyway, that's it, Pastor. Uh, I, I, I know I'm running long. Anyway, God bless you folks. Thank you so much for letting me share that. Thank you. Thank you.